I just did that entire thing muted. I am, that's quite embarrassing. I've only been doing this for, for a year. Uh, <laughs> well, welcome back everybody. Uh, that was a nice little short break for us to kind of uh, stretch our legs and get a little drink of water. Um, for those of you who were on the last session, like I said, we are joined today by Christy Odom. She is a Nikon ambassador, an amazing artist, wildlife photographer, and someone that I am happy that I was able to meet and really get along with. Uh, so Christy, if you want to unmute yourself, we can um, chat. Here we go. Hi. Um, <laughs> hey, and we're going to do the same thing like we did last session for everyone that's here. Um, just going to look at a few images have a, a kind of open conversation regarding um, intent and desire artistically to create. If you have any questions like we did last time, drop them either in the Q&A module or over into the chat session. And for anyone that is new that came on, we will also drop a link for the B&H Wildlife Week sweepstakes. Uh, today is day three. We will be closing out tomorrow, but we have some fantastic uh, prizes for you to win. So. Christy, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I, I decided to wear my wildlife shirt. I don't know if you can notice my tigers in the jungle. That's kind of amazing. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> good to see you again, John. <laughs> good to see you as well. Um, so yeah, you know, we we wrapped up a, a pretty fun session with Richard uh, as he was shooting from the north of Alaska to the south, you know, polar bears and brown bears. H have you done much bear photography in Alaska? I actually have. <laughs> I'm quite obsessed with photographing bears. And just like, just like he was saying, bears have such amazing personalities and characters and they're so beautiful and powerful. They're one of my favorite things to photograph. <laughs> now, have you shot, I, I know when we did our last talk uh, together, we, you know, we talked some about your wildlife and some of your other um, photography that you did, but have you done much shooting up in the Antarctic? No, I have not. <laughs> that, you know, that was the one thing I wanted to ask Richard, and I have not. Um, I, it, it always slips in my mind when I'm talking to people that photograph uh, that far north is how quickly the batteries just get sucked dry. Because I know that I did some shooting in Alaska, and it was, it was the fall, but we started out in... Um, started out in Anchorage, and then we drove up to, um, I believe it was called Trapper's Pass, and the temperature changed from 75 where it was t-shirts and jeans to like 28 and snow on the ground. And I just remember walking around in my battery, just completely zapping. So um, I just did not know if you had had much experience with that. No, not so much. I tend to <laughs> hang out in a little bit of warmer climates in the Arctic, <laughs> but um, hopefully one day I'll get up there. <laughs> Well, um, I would love to throw some images up on the screen if you would like, uh, give you the screen share, and then um, we can just kind of chat about the images as they come up. You did do so. Do you see my name? I do. <laughs> it looks beautiful. <laughs> well, I'm really excited today to talk about some flowers and fungus because I never thought that this would be a path that I would be on, but I have gone very deep into this rabbit hole. <laughs> And um, John, when we had that conversation to prepare, it was, you saw just how into it I am, but yeah. um, <laughs> a little bit about me. I am, it's funny though, because like, I think our path has a funny way of finding us. And for me, like, I always just, I love that feeling of being completely overwhelmed by nature. So some of the photos that I take, I try to connect people emotionally to wildlife and to celebrate those that have an emotional connection to the natural world. I never thought I would, was going to end up being a photographer. I actually went to university for electrical engineering, but I don't know if you guys remember uh, what the first thing you wanted to be when you were a kid, <laughs> like the very first dream you had. What was yours, John, when you were like a young boy? What, what did you want to be when you grew up? I wanted to be a painter. <laughs> there was a, 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 a guy, um, it wasn't Bob Ross, but there was another guy. His name was John Robbins, and he would tell a story and illustrate it live on PBS. So it was an overhead camera of him illustrating as he was telling a story. And so I've always wanted to be an artist and um, I'm lucky enough to be in marketing. <laughs> kind of an artist, right? <laughs> you work you work as an artist for sure. There's an art to that. And there's an art to everything you do. I follow your Instagram. It's fantastic. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. That means a lot. <laughs> 
Um, and if you guys want to throw in the chat room what you kind of wanted to be when you grew up, it'd be kind of fun for you guys to interact with each other. But I remember my first dream when I was a kid, I wanted to be a florist. I wanted to be a florist and I wanted to marry the kid down the road. <laughs> that was my dream. That was what's going to be my life. But then I think I started getting distracted when I started being a photographer by photographing bigger subjects and seeing the grand and, and the whale sharks and seeing the grand and the elephants. And, and I kind of went a different way. And I think somewhere along the ways, I kind of forgot the flowers. <laughs> Wow. Um, so I think it's a really interesting that like now I've kind of gone back that way, but I always want to use photography to show that animals have characters and personalities and to really bring people in so that they care and want to connect and want to save because this planet needs our voices and it needs our help. But here's one of my bear shots. I had to with the, the last speaker because I am obsessed with photographing the bears, all the, the characters and the personalities and just how beautiful and magnificent. But just to get a little bit of a background of, of what I do, I'm always looking for those moments that I feel emotion and that I feel connection with nature. So that's some of my work. <laughs> wow. But then in the last couple of years, I have been quite obsessed with insects. So I got really into bugs. I got really into the depth of biodiversity that's at our local parks. I did my first story that was published online for National Geographic, and I was really excited. It wasn't something far off and exotic. It was something close to home. It was all about butterfly and dragonfly species and the amazing citizen scientists that go around and count these species um, for scientific research and for different reasons to, to show just how much biodiversity there is at our local parks. But that opened up this whole world to me of, of just how much beauty there was close to home and how many things there are to photograph close to home. Mm -hmm. And as a lot of people that I've heard, the pandemic turned me into a bit of a birder. <laughs> so I found <laughs> I was going out to those local parks to photograph the birds and, um, you know, it, it, it was nice because I felt like for so many years I would pack up my camera and just keep it in my bag. And then whenever I was traveling, I'd pull it back out. Like I wasn't using my camera at home. It was like, if I'm going on a trip or going somewhere and this project started pulling me in to really see all that there is in the local parks. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it was funny. I, I I go to this one park that I love. Do you do you have places that you go close to home at all, John? That, that you've got some yeah. beautiful places up in New York. I, I I do, and you know, outside of what everyone knows, the the largest wild kingdom uh, there is, which is New York City. Uh, I'm very lucky that I'm on the New Jersey side of the Hudson. So for any of you that are in the the greater tri-state area of New York, if you're not aware of this please make the pilgrimage. There's a park called Liberty State Park, and it is the largest state park close to a major metropolitan city in America. Um, and it is one of the Audubon Society's top 10 birding spots. So I'm wow. extremely lucky to be able to take my daughter there. Now, to your point of looking at this image, am I photographing in there? No, <laughs> but I'm going. <laughs> I'd like to challenge you to start bringing your camera to those parks because they are just magnificent yeah. the amount from the bird life to the insect life to the you know to the fungi to mm -hmm. there's just so much in even our backyards and it's been like for me to get a natural history story published in the dc area like i i kept going to and from occoquan uh regional mm -hmm. parks and in the lorton area of northern virginia and that's where I, I, that's where I got my first National Geographic story. Like, I think that um, it, it was amazing because I didn't realize just how many butterflies and dragonfly species there were. And on the East Coast of the United States, it's actually got a ton of different insect life because it's on multiple insect migratory routes. And there's so many different um, species. I couldn't even believe it. I still can't name most of them. <laughs> I, I, I only know monarch butterfly. That's the only one I know. <laughs> it's a good one to know. They're fantastic. <laughs> There's this park that I like to go to in DC. Well, in Northern Virginia, again, I always say DC area because people don't really know my little old town of Sterling. Um, but this park was called Green Springs, Green Springs, Green Springs Park. And it had just these 
amount, tons of hummingbirds and the hummingbirds like feeding on these beautiful flowers. So I packed up all my equipment, made it out to the park and I'm looking for the hummingbirds. This is from one of my trips out there. Uh, what I was really excited about was the, the pattern on the neck. And that's what I really wanted to focus in on. I waited for the beak to go just so it hit the lines right in the, um, with the leaves in the background. But um, I remember going out another time and there were no hummingbirds. <laughs> there was no wildlife. There was no insects. And here I am at the park and I'm out, I'm ready to take photos and there's nothing to take photos of. <laughs> so I didn't want to go home without taking any photos. And I looked over the visitor center and the visitor center had these amazing florals. I'm like, you know what? The wildlife's not there. Maybe I should start playing in this little flower bed. <laughs> so this was literally like a year ago. And I, I don't know what happened, but I love flowers so much as a kid. And then it's like, I forgot to stop and look at them for years and years and years. And now all of a sudden I'm in this flower garden and I'm looking and I'm seeing these amazing complimentary colors. Wow. <laughs> and I'm seeing, this was an in-camera multiple exposure. What I saw was the Red Visitor Center with those bright green bulbs and like the bright green buds. And I love using complementary colors, which are colors that are opposite from one another on the color wheel to really bring out the drama and the intensity of color. So you put those colors next to each other and you're going to make your images pop even more. But when I saw these little buds, I wanted to play a little bit. So I was shooting with my Nikon Z7. I put my camera on multiple exposure mode with the, uh, the mode I used was the average mode. Uh, which averages all your exposures. And when it combines them, it, it, it gives an exposure that's right. So it'll, it'll average all the exposures and give you a, a middle exposure. And then in between each of the frames, I rotated the camera 90 degrees. So, you know, say this is the orientation of my camera. I'm taking a picture like this, rotated the camera 90 degrees, rotated the camera again, rotated it again so that I would get those sorts of patterns to really play with the shapes. Mm -hmm. So I did this in camera and I was pretty excited. And one of the great things about the mirrorless cameras is a lot of the mirrorless cameras have the ghosting when you do your multiple exposures. So you can line things up perfectly in between the mm -hmm. exposures. <laughs> but I found myself like just completely playing in the flowers. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's so amazing to, to, to hear this evolution and, and, and I'm, I'm happy. Um, for those of you that uh, obviously are not in Christy and my brain, we intentionally did not do a preview of her images. So these would all be new to me. So I would be, you know, viewing them at the same time as you. And to hear you with the story from the florist and then, you know, the the schooling and the picking up, you, you have such a painterly, like, uh, aesthetic. And looking at your, your wildlife, you can definitely see it with that grizzly silhouetted. Everything just has this almost serene, ethereal, painterly aspect to it and seeing this image right here I, I mean if you were not blown away by the impressionist um when you were a child I would be completely shocked well, it's funny that you say that it's funny that you see that because I think that photography is such a reflection of what we've learned along our way and and mm -hmm. where our path has gone when I was doing my electrical engineering I was actually going into photovoltaic engineering at Georgia Tech I was in my third year and I ended up I started shooting concerts for my school newspaper or for Georgia Tech's like newspaper. I ended up like, I think it was the day before my 21st birthday photographing U2, <laughs> photographing Bono while he was on stage and I was just shaking. And I remember having a lot of trouble going to my digital signal processing class the next day. And that was when I decided to leave electrical engineering. I was like, if photography's taken me here, Imagine where I can go because our jobs as photographers to capture our passions and capture these high moments in life and these beautiful things in life and share them. So after three years and a full scholarship, <laughs> I actually transferred into a fine arts degree with a concentration in photo media. So we studied painters and we studied, um, you know, artists and, and, you know, we studied the photographers that founded, you know, it turned photography, which when photography came out, it was this machine taking photos of what was there. And there were all these photographers that started showing like, no, 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 there's art to this. There's our heart that's in this. There's a, a way of, of projecting our emotions and making people feel, and there's something much deeper. So there were all these photographers that took the camera from a machine and, and, and made it art 
art. And I think it's interesting though, because like my lowest grade in electrical engineering was higher than my highest grade in fine arts. I almost failed out of that degree, but it was really nice to, to study. And I think I needed to learn how to let myself be creative. I needed to learn how to shift the way I was thinking. And a lot of that is when you go out to ask yourself what you're thinking and what you're feeling and seeing if you can put that into your work. I was feeling complimentary oh, colors. I was feeling playfulness. I was feeling myself as a child in this flower garden. So I took, <laughs> I took a few of these multiple exposures that day. And this was kind of like the first journey into florals for me. I saw this beautiful leaf that had this backlight and the backlight was bringing out the reds and the, the green. I'm like, ah, oh, complimentary mm -hmm. colors again. So I did multiple exposure mode with the mode being average. And I did three exposures and I rotated the camera in between each exposure, lined it up because I wanted it to represent a textile. It made me think of a, a gentleman's suit, it made me think of tweed. <laughs> right. So I wanted to play with it. But then the one image that I think really sung to what I was experiencing in the flower garden was this image. That's and it's so because beautiful. I went back to my childhood. I went back to my childhood in that flower garden and I started thinking of the pinwheels I used to play with. I used to love playing with pinwheels. I saw the colors of the butterfly and this butterfly was feeding on this beautiful flower. So I took this in camera. This was multiple exposure mode, average, four exposures again. And once again, I rotated the camera in between each exposure and I lined up the center of the butterfly at the same point so that it would make a pinwheel. And I was like, you know, I was definitely feeling like my childhood self and my love in that flower garden. And I can't believe I've spent so many years kind of forgetting to photograph the flowers. And I've, this journey has taken me a lot farther. <laughs> I've been playing a lot and I have been sucked way in. And um, one of the things that I like doing with the florals is, um, you know, really asking myself, what am I seeing and what am I experiencing and how can I put that into the narrative? And a lot of times I'm creating digital art by using post-processing. I remember when I went out to the sunflower field, the thing that I was taken away by when I saw the sunflowers was this intense pattern. Uh, when I see pattern, I just want to see pattern repeated. Like I want to see more of that pattern. So I remember taking a photograph of a sunflower and then I cut a quarter of it. And then I took it into Photoshop and I reflected that quarter and I reflected it and I reflected it because I wanted to play with repetition of pattern because my old self that used to compete in mathematics and, and loves engineering and, and loves this stuff. Like I wanted to, I wanted to bring that pattern to a different level that maybe was surreal. And in that, um, yeah. So by using simple Photoshop techniques, this takes about two minutes in Photoshop. So you just cut things perfectly. And then you take that and you give yourself a bigger canvas, you copy what you've, um, you know, that one quarter and you reflect it and copy and reflect and then copy and reflect and copy and reflect. And I ended up um, making this, which I ended up like wow. randomly getting challenged to make this into a giant puzzle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I still have yeah. not completed that puzzle, but I have it. <laughs> it's kind of the most annoying puzzle in the world. And I kind right. of, hate my friend that suggested that I did that, but <laughs> yeah, I, I could, tell, I would buy that puzzle that it, it's almost like an optical illusion. It's, um, it's mesmerizing. Wow. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And like, you know, I mean, I do like playing with my floral stuff and then like doing this reflection stuff. And, um, one of the things when I see specific patterns, like here's another example, like even not necessarily of flowers, but the tree trunk, seeing that pattern in this tree, I'm pretty sure this tree is probably struck by lightning, which caused these crazy patterns. So I took these three images and I did the same thing. I just took them into Photoshop and I played with reflecting them. So the first image is going to be the first one reflected and the second, and the third, as you can tell in this sequence, they're very similar images. It's the same area, just a little bit lower, a little bit to the right, but playing with this reflection technique, um, made me feel something different. It brought the images, uh, it, it gave them a different narrative, which I had a lot of fun with <laughs> and really emphasized that texture and emphasized that pattern. And this one, and then the one after, I think feel completely different, even though they're such similar shots, but different patterns kind of came out. Mm -hmm. 
So I've been playing with that. I know it's kind of silly, but I like playing with flowers and I like playing with reflections. And so why not play a little bit and see what you can kind of come up with? And, you know, I don't feel it's silly. I I was actually going to lead into this and and Naveen um, typed in a very, very good question. Um, And it's when you started out with photography, what was the biggest eye opener? What, what was your your moment? You kind of spoke to shooting Bono as a, as a young adult. Um, (laughs) But what was there a moment where you just said, you know, I'm, I'm going in, I'm diving in head first. And then what were your expectations versus the reality that brought you here? Because you're evolving since I met you a year ago. I mean, a lot of the new work that's coming out, uh, you're, you're evolving and, and the fine art aspect has always been there. Like I said, from the very beginning of looking at your images, but getting into this imagery, it's, it's just taken such a hard right turn. And yet we're in the same vehicle, if that makes any sense. I, I feel that I, I'm still following you. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I guess that that's more of a, a statement than a question that I made, but to, to, to Naveen's question, um, you know, what was that big eye opener for you? What was that moment? Was it Bono? Naveen, that's such a great, great question. And I love John, what you said, because I think is being an artist is a continuous journey and it's a continuous journey into ourselves and into discovery. And it's been, such a gift to, to be able to have that as a career and have that in my life and have a camera in my life. But for me, the biggest moment was um, when I was in Australia, I was photographing sharks and I was going scuba diving with them. And I remember all the chaos and noise and I was afraid. I mean, you hear about sharks and, and I had this fear. I was um, 20 years old at the time. And you get in the water and you've got that big Darth Vader sound from your, <laughs> and you know, like you're breathing through this machine and we go underwater and then there's all these sharks. And I remember this sense of calm came over me when I saw the sharks, it was like all this intensity and buildup and, and fear. And then when we got in the water, it's like, what I saw was simplicity and grace and beauty. They were so I mean, just not what I expected. And I loved it. And I was like, almost in tears, I was so overwhelmed. So I thought I want to put that into how I was shooting. I was shooting with an Iconist 5 back then. So I have my 36 shots underwater, film cameras underwater, very challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) But I remember I had um, Tri-X, I had black and white film in that camera. I remember looking up and trying to think, well, how can I bring out that grace and that simplicity? So I decided to produce a silhouette. I put the camera straight up and I started looking to see the sharks swimming above. And I got this one photo of three sharks in the same sunburst making a shape. And when I saw that photo, it was such a reflection of what I was feeling and experiencing and such a reflection of the beauty and the grace and not the fear. And to me, that image represented what I wanted people to see and what I wanted them to feel as opposed to what I thought would be there. And that's when I realized just how powerful the camera is a a tool. It was the first photo I ever took that I loved. I wish I'd put it in in here now, but (laughs) I love that picture. And um, it ended up, I I contacted a graphic designer and, and that photo ended up becoming my logo just to remind me of that first image and how photography is a tool to express who we are as individuals and who we are as artists and how it can be something to show our own experiences and our own feelings towards things. So that was a great question. I hope you don't mind my long answer, but I no. liked the question. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I think that's the, the, the number one thing. And I'm finding as I'm reading through the chat and trying to look at your images at the same time, the, the engagement of, of how you got here seems to be a, a reoccurring question. Uh, although I do want to go back because this is quite hilarious to me. You asked everybody at the top of the hour, what they wanted to be when they grew up. And we got some great answers, fighter pilots, cartoon artists, uh, engineers, uh, architect, and I am one, but uh, Angela had the best one. Uh, I'm 44 years old and I refused to grow up, but I wanted to be a cook, then a scientist, then a lawyer, then a diplomat. And now I'm getting more serious about photography. So, you know, wow. Angela, every one of those careers, I think that you should explore while photographing. Exactly. And some <laughs> of the most successful photographers are people that have had careers in other areas. So like, um, I mean, electrical engineering into photography, um, Oh my gosh, I'm going to blank on his name. Uh, Edgar Ten, who is the guy that did the bullet with the balloons and the um, um, 
the water droplets, the very first. You, you oh know, now, now you're going to convince my photography professor that the C he gave me in the history of photography was well warranted. <laughs> Uh, thank you for opening that wound up, Christy. <laughs> oh, well, he, he used his engineering to develop these high powered flashes and, and brought out like, you know, bullets going through cards and stuff. I think it was, I don't know. I'm so sorry. If you guys know the name, put it in the chat room. I'm blanking. I blank when I'm in front of the, <laughs> in front of the street sometimes. Um, but also like, I know so many amazing biologists and scientists that have used photography to show something different and show what they're passionate about and show different things and give us these insights into animals and behaviors. And so if you've got something from the outside, I've seen John, like, you know, your background in architecture comes out in your photography. And I think that that is a beautiful thing. So let's, let's use those, you know, I, I like the, you know, I just think it's funny. I think it's funny that like the florals have kind of come back and I'm excited to show you guys some more flowers. I, I would love to. <laughs> and, and Christian uh, came to the rescue. It was Her Harold Egerton. It was Egerton. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming to the rescue, Christian. So yeah, so let's dig. It. Let's dig into some more images. You were getting a ton of accolades uh, across the board on all of them, so um, everyone's loving it. Well, thank you so much. I've started playing too with the shapes of twigs and stuff when I go out in the winter and there aren't flowers. So taking things and you know you don't have to have that in camera multiple exposure. There are things that you can overlap and post and kind of play with that way to create digital art. So taking things that are simple and then repeating patterns and playing and playing with opacity. It's been something I've been kind of having fun with. Um, but I would have never stopped at these little simple things, like how these sticks are, how these plants are interacting with one another and holding one another. And while I do, I, I do kind of prefer the simple image, I did play around in Photoshop. Uh, started playing with those patterns, started reflecting them, moving them, copying them. And just kind of really having fun, <laughs> you know? So sometimes if you don't want to leave the house, you want to sit on your computer, but you still want to create art, like taking some of these simple shots, cutting out a piece of it, repeating pattern and, and, and playing, you can create things Whoa. that are a lot of fun. So I've been having fun with my sticks. <laughs> that is so amazing that you were able to visualize this out of that original simplistic image and, and it, if you would have showed me this image first, I would have thought you had photographed a wrought iron sculpture somewhere. Um, I also love the fact that you keep saying play, play. This doesn't work to you, you know, and that, that's, that's, that's great. I mean, you know, for me, the idea of, of sitting down and playing uh, oftentimes does not revolve around multiple exposure manipulation. And now I'm looking at these and I'm like, wonder how many of my images I should actually play with versus just leaving them as they are. Simply great. I think one of the things the last year has really taught us is slowing down and not getting out and shooting as much. And so one of the things that I've really been having fun with is I've got archives of images that have just been sitting there. What was I drawn to? Why did that image not work? Maybe I can see what I can do and see if I can elevate it and see if I can create digital art. But then I got onto a whole new journey, which was my time-lapse journey. <laughs> I am started... super, I'm super excited to jump into the time-lapse, but I just wanted you to answer this before we segue okay. over. Uh, Angela asked uh, if you could talk a little bit more about how much you're actually editing in Photoshop and, and uh, how you actually do this. Like, So how much time are you actually spending and what is the technique uh, to be able to get these um, images to look like this? I'm not spending too much time with the simple reflection things like those take me literally just, you know, one to two minutes, like they're pretty easy. This one I probably worked on for a good 15, 20 minutes playing around. So a lot of it's just copying and playing with the opacity and then shifting and moving things around in Photoshop. So just adding a whole bunch of layers that are the same and then doing a lot of flipping and a lot of opacity changes. Um, but no, it's just something that sometimes I play around with. So it doesn't take too long. It took a little while the first time I played with it, which was the, the first time I ever did anything like this was the sunflower shot, which is why I showed that one first, because I got home and I really wanted to elevate those images. And I was like, well, what about, what would happen if I repeated the pattern? What would happen if I started playing with repetition of pattern? And that's when I kind of got into just using simple mirroring in Photoshop and how that would kind of play. And then 
I do a lot of teaching and a lot of people were curious about, well, my camera doesn't have multiple exposure. What can I do without multiple exposure? So that's when I, you know, for teaching sake is when I started playing around with, well, what can I do with my own images without multiple exposure to kind of be able to demonstrate? And then I ended up discovering, oh my gosh, why am I not doing this? <laughs> I feel a little guilty that I started doing this for the sake of being able to teach others because I feel like I wish I had just gone on this journey myself, wow. but um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to play more and I'm excited to do more and start printing these out because I think that um, it's been, it's been a fun journey. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that leads into the, uh, another question um, you, and you hit on that. So you are doing education. How can the attendees here find an educational course with you? Because we had a lot of questions regarding your technique um, as well as dodging and burning and, and different tutorials. So do you have online classes or will we be doing more in real life classes that people can find on your website? Um, I would, I, I definitely do a lot of online mentoring and a lot of, um, I'm, I'm doing six month mentoring programs right now, where I'm working with photographers throughout a longer period of time. And I do a lot of shorter, either three week or six week mentoring programs in order to kind of help teach photographers, different tools and techniques. If you want to find out more information about that, you just go to my website, christyodom.com and put your name in the subscribe and I will send out more information about that. I also do um, post about those on my Instagram feed, but I would, I would love to be able to help more artists and help people. So I'm always, and that's one of the things that I think is crazy is I would have never had these longer term mentoring programs or worked with photographers for longer periods if I was living the life I was before COVID because I was traveling so much to these exotic locations and I was going so far to take photos, but now it's like, Oh my God, there's so much art to be had, even in the winter when there's no leaves or no flowers. But I feel like it's really cool too, because the last, I would say only four or five months, that's when I've started doing the stuff inside with the florals and the mushrooms. It's opened up even closer to home. Like the photography I'm doing is taking place in my home. And it's been, it's just been amazing. Like I'm constantly like have a camera going off doing the time lapses and things like that. And that's been a a great journey because I really do think that we can be artists all the time and it's been a lot of fun. So yeah, no, I would love for you to subscribe to my newsletter and I'll, I'll let you guys know if there's classes or anything. <laughs> awesome. So let's, uh, let's uh, jump forward. Like you, we were about ready to, I mean, I'm excited for this next evolution. Oh my gosh. Okay. So time loss was a lot harder than I thought. It took me a long time to figure out, like there was a lot of fails. <laughs> It was a lot, a lot of fails, which I'm excited that I can kind of share with you guys so that you don't have to do those because it was literally like three months of fails. Wow. Um, but here is kind of the first um, successful time lapses I got of some florals. Oh, that's so cool. It's interesting too, because flowers have different personalities. Like some of them they'll open every day and then close every night. And some of them will like, but it took me a long time to understand how to get these time lapses. Wow. And I'll tell you guys what I was doing wrong. Well, I mean, first off, like if you know the right people, call your friends. Like I have a friend that runs a flower farm <laughs> and I didn't call her until I failed for like three months. I was like, Christy, you've got a close friend that runs a flower farm. Call them, ask them. Because what would happen was I'd get my camera all set up. I'd get my flowers. I'd put them in front of the camera. I'd set up a time lapse. And then like three days, the flower wouldn't do anything. It would just stay. <laughs> like, like, why are these flowers not opening? What's going on? And then I'm like, well, maybe it's the light source because I was using artificial light. Maybe it needs the sunlight. That was not the case at all. I was going to the grocery store and buying grocery store flowers. And grocery store flowers are treated chemically because they're shipped overseas. So they've kind of, they're kind of stuck in this, this one phase. They don't really open and close. Um, and that's why they stay pretty for like a week on your counter. Like that's what they're designed to do. They're not designed to like, you know, they'll stay pretty and then just die, <laughs> you know? So I thought that that was, so when I called my friend that ran the flower farm, she was like, oh, Christy, you got to buy from local florist. You got to support your local flower farms and buy from local forest florist that have flowers that aren't chemically treated. And so I thought that that was really, really cool. So um, here, I'll put this image up. So there's an image up. 
So you know, one thing I learned about flowers is you, you buy from flower farms and those, those flowers, they move, like they open, they close, they, they do all these things. But my friend also gave me all these tricks to open flowers. So buying direct from a flower farm. And then when you get your flower and you want them to open, you cut the stem, you put the flower in warm water with sugar and flower food. And if you have a fresh flower with sugar, flour, flour food, warm water, these were opening in three, four hours. Wow. So it was really cool. And these anemones, if I'm saying that right, mm-hmm. that's a really hard word to say. <laughs> they, that's what I was photographing here. It, 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 it would open and close every morning and night. So I could re-photograph the same flower the next morning. I have this amazing friend over at the florist farm, Harmony, Harmony Harvest that have offered anyone watching a discount code. If you want to order some flowers, it's Odom 21 in caps. <laughs> so you'll get a little bit of a discount, but if you want to order direct from a flower farm, uh, that's what I was doing. Cause I was taking a lot of these during winter and there weren't flower farms for me to go out and find these flowers. So I was ordering them online. And so they would come in and then I would open and get, open the box and get photos of them opening and closing and all sorts of things. But if you have a chance, like there's a website called American Grown to kind of check and see what flower farms are in your area. So just go to americangrown.com uh, or go to your local farmer's market, go to your local farmer's market and meet people. But when I was, um, one of the things I constantly do when I take photos is I ask myself, what am I seeing and what am I feeling? And when I saw the anemones, anemones, (laughs) what I saw is like just a whole bunch of dancing and a whole bunch of movement. So I wanted to incorporate that. And so what I started doing was I started stacking the time lapses. So I would take the series of images that I got by shooting on an interval timer mode on my computer, on my camera, not using time-lapse movie, but interval timer mode because I wanted the individual files. So shooting at that interval timer mode with my intervals usually being between one, 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 one shot every minute is usually what I would do for florals. For mushrooms, I do one shot every three minutes. Uh, Because mushrooms are much slower than the flowers I've learned, the flowers that I've been doing. And if you do build up those relationships and start talking to flower farmers, they'll let you know about the individual flowers, like certain ones are more prone to open and close. And so finding people that can help you figure out the right flowers to photograph definitely helps as well. But so I took all those flowers and I took a seat, I took about 20 images in the middle of the, the flower opening and I stacked that in Photoshop because I wanted the movement. That's what I wanted to be part of the narrative. So here's a couple of the shots of the flower moving. And then I ended up making a triptych out mm-hmm. of um, just the opening and the movement that I was experiencing and feeling because you see flowers and you think they're going to be still, but mm-hmm. I mean, these flowers also, you know, if you're doing the time lapses, give it some extra space. Cause they dance. <laughs> like, you wow. do this beautiful time lapse and it would open, but it would open just on the side of the frame. <laughs> and you're like, no, <laughs> this is, is so, such a beautiful image. And it, it is just, it evokes <laughs> calm is the only word I could use. It's just, it's so unbelievably calming to me. <laughs> it was so much fun. And it was, I mean, this is a journey I'm still on. So I'm still pulling the flowers in and I have had my little segue into mushrooms, which I'm excited to talk to you guys about as well. Cause I never knew I'd be so obsessed with fungi. Um, but just to show you a couple of other images, cause I think that there's so much like digital art. There's so much we can do as photographers with florals. But another way I was trying to capture that movement in the florals is I was putting a flash on my camera And I was putting the flash on rear sync and doing longer exposures and moving the camera around in the middle of my exposures of the florals to try to bring out this feeling. So this was, um, yeah, I had my SB 5000 on rear sync, um, my shutter at 0.8 of a second. And I moved the camera around focused in and, and it got the center super sharp with the flash, but having that shutter open a little bit longer it incorporated my own movement that I was either zooming in or moving around or spiraling around the flower. So there's a couple more shots that I did just to kind of really bring out. And these were those amazing anemones that I ordered from Harmony Harvest. And I highly recommend that if you guys are looking for a flower farm, like a great place to order from, came in overnight and flowers were... I I photographed these flowers. I kept opening and closing. It was so lovely. On this one, I put a yellow flower next to it. And during the longer exposure, I shifted my camera over to the right so that the yellow flower would come through. 
So there's all sorts of things that you can kind of do. I've also bought myself a little mister, little spray bottle that does this fine mist. <laughs> so oh, doing wow. macro style shots with um, the fine water droplets. Because I kept being like, how are these people getting such perfect water droplets? And I'm like, oh, they've got a little mister. There's all sorts <laughs> of little misters. Like just go to the store, a dollar fifty, get a little spray mister, right? Um, which can help bring out those beads and make them a little more perfect. And a lot of people, when they go out to their own gardens, they'll spray a little mist on there. Um, and so doing things like that, but also like bringing out more and more detail by using image stacking. So this was, I think, a series of like 30 images where I focused in on the closest point and I used focus stacking. So that's when you move your focus a little bit between each image. And a lot of the cameras will do that. My Z7 does it in camera for me. And then you take all of that and you put it in post and it'll take all those sharpest bits and, and, and increase your depth of field because with macro, you get a very tiny depth of field. So being able to stack a whole bunch of different areas that are in focus uh, is a way that a lot of photographers increase their macro depth of field. <laughs> it's gorgeous. And it, it is so alien. You know, I, I know they're flowers, but you've done such an abstraction with the water droplets and creating texture and depth. Um, it's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much. And then I take it and like, I took this one. So this was another focus stack. So I was playing around cause I love the textures. And then I ended up playing around with my reflection stuff. <laughs> so I had a little bit of fun in Photoshop to make this, oh, this piece of digital art. So here's the first image. And then I rotated it and copied it and reflected it to kind of bring out more pattern and bring out a little bit more, I don't know, just something a little bit different. <laughs> yeah. And we had a question regarding technique. Are you just using plain water or glycerin when you're spraying that? I was just using plain water. I know some people like will put like corn, cornstarch in water, or things like that in order to bring out different textures or reflections. I haven't done any of that yet, but um, yeah, I just kind of spray it with water right now. <laughs> Great and question. Also though. I had another question. Um, how do you get the black, the backgrounds completely black? A lot of times that's because of the lighting on the foreground. So the lighting on the subject um, is a lot brighter, which drops my background into darkness. So a lot of times I'm using a curtain or I'm using something that is dark in the first place. Um, and I've had to do that a lot with my time lapses is put, make sure that the light is hitting just the subject, but that's a great question. So that the background stays dark. Cause I don't want, I don't want that background distraction as part of the image. Got it. Fantastic. Oh yeah. Lots of questions. This is cool. <laughs> so simple things too, like the macro shots of the details of leaves. Like this is a, 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 a dead leaf that was beautiful with all the colors that came out, but just playing with the reflection technique. So having a little bit more fun. <laughs> and then speaking of reflections, I started playing around with reflections with my time lapses just because why not? Right. <laughs> why so, not? Why not? <laughs> So I made this. This is my first little test piece. Oh, it's so beautiful. <laughs> That's kind of funky. I don't know. I'm just kind of enjoying them and making them for myself. But then, oh my gosh. Okay, so in March, I took a, I took a film class. I am starting to do adventure film. And in my film class, we had this assignment where we were matched with two people we didn't know. So total of three people. I was matched with these two photographers, uh, cinematographers in Canada, and we had to make a video. <laughs> so we had to make and produce like a three minute video that had to do with mountain culture. Uh, and I ended up using what I had just done to make our intro logo. So we could make our own fake brand and our intro logo. And because it was three people that didn't know each other, we gave ourselves the fake name, the unknown trio, because <laughs> we didn't know any. And I liked the idea of like our minds opening. So I used this, um, you know, time lapse of a tulip opening and I reflected it three ways. And I'm also like super obsessed with shape. So I played with the opacity and here's my little fake logo. <laughs> I was so excited about this. Wow. I am under the impression that you've been talking to Christopher Nolan, or is this something that I need to make the introduction for uh, you to work with him? <laughs> That'd be amazing. <laughs> it was just a lot of fun. I was like, oh my gosh. It was like everything we did for this like class, our film had to be taken during the month of March. So during the course of the film. And so like, I even like did that time-lapse during that period. So it was like 
I was like, I'm so excited about my little intro thing. I don't know. It just, it that was, uh, that was beautiful. I, I am loving the evolution from still into motion and then doing the reflection. Your, your energy is just so infectious regarding this. And I just, I want to see more. Give, <laughs> give me more, Christy. Give me more. Well, now it's like, this is where the journey to me like completely changed. And I was like, you know, how, okay. So yeah, I kind of geek out at the fact that it's like, you know, the ads that you get on Facebook and how well it knows you. Mm -hmm. So here I am like messing around on Facebook and it's like, grow your own mushrooms at home. And I'm like, wow, Facebook, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds brilliant. Like absolutely brilliant. Like, yes. So I started ordering from the Facebook ads, like these, like grow your own mushroom things at home. And I started playing around with fungi time lapses. <laughs> I never knew I'd have so much fun with fungi, but this was my very first attempt, my first fungi time lapse. And I was doing the same thing, the interval timing shooting on my Z, Z72. The Z72, I can plug direct into the wall so I can like keep it going for days because mushroom growth a lot of times is like three, four days. So I was doing, um, one photo every three minutes and letting it run for multiple days. And sometimes I'd go in and change the angle because I like those clips to different angles. But this was my very first mushroom time lapse. Oh, that is so cool. I don't think I've ever seen a mushroom grow before. Yeah, it's like they just sprout out of nothing and they just like have this texture. That is so cool. So then I took my own advice, like the advice that I just gave everyone here to go to a farmer's market and meet people. <laughs> well, I was like, go to a farmer's market, meet a flower farm. So I went to this farmer's market that was down the road from me and I met these amazing gentlemen from the humble fungi, the humble fungus. And they've also given us a discount code today. If you guys are curious, you just put time lapse in, you get 20% off your first order if you want to order these bricks to make these mushrooms at home. So it's the humble fungus and time lapse, all lowercase, one word, get you a discount. But when I went there, I just met these two gentlemen that were just mushroom enthusiasts and they run the shop or they sell mushrooms. And it was unbelievably amazing. And I just, we just kept talking and I was like, can I photograph time lapses of your mushrooms? And they're like, yes. <laughs> and they started educating me. They showed me their facility, which is unbelievable and started showing me all these different species of mushrooms and I'm growing five different species in my house right now. <laughs> <laughs> so they started helping me and then like oh my gosh they showed me these pink oyster mushrooms let me just show you this time lapse because this is it looks like a sponge that's so cool wow and you know what's awesome is like how many things do you get to photograph and then eat afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. That's so. <laughs> it, it, Luke wrote in the comments: uh, the oyster mushrooms are uh, super easy to grow and cool to watch. Um, so yes, if you are interested, uh, definitely, definitely take up that uh, offer code to get some mushrooms. And I, you know, I you, you dropped a challenge earlier in our conversation for me to photograph the birds in the Liberty State Park, I think I'm going to go the opposite direction and buy some mushrooms today. <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool. Oh my gosh. I had no idea I'd go down this, this, like, I mean, I find that I am just, I'm so enthralled and the gentlemen over at the humble fungus have been telling me these stories about how fungi can help battle climate change and how they actually have intelligence, how they move and grow. And I'm just like, what is this world? <laughs> I had no idea. And um, so I just, I, I, I had a time lapse that just finished the other day, like yesterday, and I'm really excited to start working on those. Um, and it's been, it's just been so crazy too. And when you get the, the mushrooms, it's like, not only do you have these time lapses that you can do, but you've got these like crazy, beautiful textures like using a single light source and, and really bringing out those textures on the under undersides of the mushrooms. Like it's just these patterns that I could have never imagined. And I wow. find that I'm like, I'm not ready to cook them quite. I actually feel guilty when I eat them. Cause I'm like, Oh my God, I've grown these and they're, they're so beautiful. I don't, 
I don't want to fry them up, but they always do. And I think that they're delicious, but it's been, it's been a crazy, crazy journey from like feeling like I need to go photograph the whales or photograph mm. bears or go photograph these animals that are really far away to realizing that there's crazy depths of biodiversity in our own local parks and our backyards from the insect species to the plants, to being able to create digital art, even with the sticks. And now producing work for my own home with flowers that I've been ordering in or growing mushrooms and having these amazing subjects to, to, to be able to be an artist at home. It's been like such a crazy journey. And I hope that some of you guys start producing more artwork from your houses and kind of having fun with it. Cause it, it has just opened up so much beauty that I never knew was there. And I, I love being able to be an artist. <laughs> And, and you are an unbelievable artist and, and your, your evolution and your transformation has, has been amazing to watch from looking at your previous work to the year that I've known you and getting into the, the abstractions. Um, I, I, I was completely and utterly taken by your, your passion for, for this, that I started going around and I have been doing some uh, macro photography with some household things. And I do have to give a shout out to uh, B&H's very own Christian Domek uh, on macro week. Uh, he started a challenge with uh, Matt Hill from the gratis group, or excuse me, I'm so sorry. He's with Mac group. I apologize. Um, and they did a whole series of, of macro photography work. And it is that simple thing, like you said, just tweaking your vision, you know, we don't have to look so far away. We can oftentimes just look within our own backyard. I know several people in the comments were from the East Coast, South Carolina to uh, Virginia. And one of the, the um, attendees wrote in that you should visit the Blue Ridge Parkway, especially in the northern part of South Carolina because of the migration. Um, that's where all of my family is from, is from Asheville all the way down to Charleston. And it was amazing to me leaving North Carolina and coming to, to New York and then going back down there how much biodiversity you forget is right in front of you until you leave it for a decade. And then you go back and you just, it's, it's just lush and amazing. So that, that bit of advice, Christy was, was heard. And I hope like Christy said, for all of the attendees that are here is that we start looking in our own backyards or within driving distance without having a wanderlust to have to go um, around the world. Oftentimes, people are traveling from other parts to where you are. And I, I see a uh, Sassafas mountain, South Carolina. Um, it's, it's really interesting to me that, you know, I, I grew up uh, in Jacksonville beach, Florida, and right below me was the oldest city in America, St. Augustine. So I would go surfing there. I would ride my bike there. And it was just odd to me why people would travel from all over the country to this little town that was below me that had like nothing fun and then, you know, as you get to be an adult, you realize, you know, the people are wanting to show their family the oldest city in America and the history. So uh, this is a challenge dropped by Christy. And now I'm going to reiterate, I think all of us should not only focus in our backyard, but see what's interesting in our home. You know, let's, let's buy some flowers and mushrooms and, and let's have a an ongoing uh B and H and Christy Odom challenge. I love um, it. I love it. And if you guys are interested at all, follow me on Instagram. But speaking of Instagram, I do have a hashtag that I follow, which is KO nature hashtag KO nature. So hashtag, if you do photograph any of these florals or fungi, make sure to hashtag that and hashtag B and H wildlife week. And um, so we can see what you guys have produced from this. <laughs> So I'm going to stop this share, but thank you guys all for your time. And I think we have time for maybe one question because we rambled, John. Well, we did answer questions throughout. <laughs> yeah, we did. Yeah, we, we, we both are chatty, but I, I love it. And, and we do have several questions, actually, that, that come through. Um, I'm going to go in backward order. Uh, so are you doing focus adjusting uh, during your time lapse? No, that's actually a really good question. But um, wow, that would solve some problems if I could figure out how to do that. So I end up maximizing my aperture as much as I can because the mushrooms do grow towards the camera a lot and I have to kind of predict where they're going to grow. And um, so a lot of times, like a lot of the clips are because they've gotten so big that I need a different plane of focus. 
So a lot of times I'm, I'm shooting at an F22 or even with my 105, I'm shooting at like a F45 because those 105 macros can change their relative apertures with macro, which is a whole different conversation, right, John? <laughs> we won't get into the <laughs> physics of that one. But um, no, I think that, um, so I, I, I keep everything on manual. I keep it manual focus. I actually have, I use the ring light that I'm using right now on me. I use the ring light because I need that static light and I have to use a really slow shutter to make sure that the LED doesn't cause any flickering. So there were all sorts of little things and, and maybe, you know, maybe B&H, maybe you guys want to have me back to do a time-lapse class. And I'd love to go through all the specifics with that. Um, who, who, who here would like to see that? Who here would like to see a Christy Odom B&H time-lapse course? Uh, th throw in uh, into the chat and let us know. Yep. yep people want to see it. It's coming in. <laughs> All right, we, we will make that happen. Um, and you actually answered the second question as well. So the, the last question is, is a, uh, a nice little softball to you. Uh, what's your favorite lens? Oh my gosh, I like so many of them. It's funny because I've just talked about all this stuff, but I'm like obsessed with the, the Nikkor 500, like 5.6 lens, even though I didn't yeah. use any of that for any of this macro. Um, for the macro, a lot of times I use the 105 macro. I love the Nikkor 105. Um, but yeah, so those are some of my favorites, <laughs> you know, and, and I, I was joking uh, for the attendees that it's a softball uh, question because it's one of the things for the, for the decade I've been with B&H attending thousands of trade shows and seminars and sitting down with amazing artists such as Christy, um, the, the depth chart and the reason why Nikon makes so many lenses is that there is an opportunity for every one of them and every photographer I've ever asked what's your favorite lens? It's like, oh, come on. Like, what am I photographing? <laughs> you can have one lens and one body on a desert island. And it's like, well, I would choose to actually have a boat. So take the camera. Um, but yeah, I, I, I love that question. It's always such a hard one to, to truly answer. But as always, well, I also, is, just to throw it out there, I also yeah. noticed that um, the Nikon lenses have a little bit of a sale right now. So if you are looking for those Nikon lenses, it's a really good time. Sorry, I had to say that, John. <laughs> quite, quite all right. <laughs> totally understand. Uh, so we are wrapping up on the hour. So if anyone has any last minute questions, uh, please let us know in the chat. Also remember the hashtag BH photo, excuse me, BH wildlife week. Uh, we are doing a... Um, sweepstakes at the end tomorrow will be our last day ralph lee hopkins and zach noyle will be joining us tomorrow uh, we threw into the chat uh, christy's website as well as her insta handle so like she said we have dropped the gauntlet and the challenge has been made for all of you to photograph flowers and fungi <laughs> and get creative and, and tag us and let us know um, exactly what it is you would like to see. If any of you are interested in any gear, you can email bhshows at bhphoto.com and it will go to one of our reps um, that is familiar with this. And this will also live on our YouTube website if you wanted to come back and get any more of the information that was given to us. Um, Christy, I don't wanna go, but I, I, I think that our time is coming to a close and I look forward to, we just, the, the audience literally has spoken. We have just created a, a new class that we need to figure out with you uh, on time lapse. And I think it would be a fun, fun, fun time. Well, thank you all. And please keep producing art no matter where you're at in your home and your local parks. There really are things all around us that, that we can use to explore and have fun and show beauty that is all around us. Thank you all for your time today. I so appreciate it. <laughs> and, you know, again, I have to say it before we close, your energy is amazing. And I love the fact that you kept saying fun. I love the fact that you kept saying art. We can be image makers. We can be photographers. Uh, we can, we can do puzzles as we found out from Christy from our photographs. So I love it. I look forward to the next time. See you all around and have a good day. Bye.